Corn is one of the oldest crops we've grown as humans, and it's actually a pretty easy crop to grow, so we're gonna do it start to finish in this video. Kevin Espiritu here from Epic Gardening, where it's my goal to help you grow a greener thumb. This little matrix back here is my little approximation of those huge cornfields that you see out in the Midwest. We're doing it in a small in-ground bed here, going from start to finish, like I said, all the way from starting these seeds, which you'll see, to the actual kitchen and resulting harvest of this corn. So there's a lot of things you have to keep in mind. It's a pretty easy crop. Corn's a grass, actually. It's easy to grow, but there are some pollination things you have to keep in mind, as well as some other tips I think will really help you in your corn harvest. So cultivate that like button for perfect pollination and fatty ears, and let's get into the video. The first thing we have to talk about are the types of corn that you have the option to grow. I'm gonna recommend one that I think you should grow, but you've got things like flint corn, dent corn, popcorn, ornamental style corns, and you could grow all those. You're probably just not going to get the result that you want. The result you probably want in your garden is gonna come from sweet corn. That's the one that you can grab a husk off, shuck it, and you can actually just enjoy it fresh straight out of the garden. And it's one of the best things, it's the most satisfying thing in the garden you can do. Now things like dent corn, those are actually grown, that's the most popular corn in America. It's grown at huge scale in massive monocultures to produce corn syrup, you know, tortilla chips, cornmeal, those types of products. But if you actually eat it, you're gonna have a bad time. It's not good for eating. Popcorn, you certainly could grow, but you'd wanna let it dry on the stalk and then you'd get the kernels out when they're nice and hard, and then you'd pop them. So as it's named, you could grow it for popcorn, but most of us are probably gonna focus on sweet corn. The next thing to know about planting and making sure you don't cross-pollinate your corn, a couple different strategies. So what's interesting, let's take just peppers. I got peppers hiding behind here over there. Now, they're all planted right next to one another, so you might say, well, they're gonna cross-pollinate. And you're actually right, they will cross-pollinate, but the thing that's going to be a hybrid is the actual seed the pepper fruits themselves are going to remain true to type to whatever I planted. So if I put a shishito in the ground and a jalapeno and somehow they crossed, the seeds would be a hybrid. I'm still getting shishito and jalapeno this season. So if I'm not saving seeds, I don't really care, right? With corn, it's actually quite different because what you're eating is the actual kernel, the seed itself. When you actually cross pollinate corn, it will show up in that year's crop. And so you want to avoid that if you are growing a couple different varieties and you don't want them to mix. So a couple things you can do. The first is the easiest, and that's to plant in isolated blocks. So this herb bed I'm sitting in, this could be a block of corn. I could have a bunch coming up and maybe I'd plant another one in my front yard. In fact, that's what I did. I have one in my front and my back. They're isolated, they're different varieties. They're not gonna cross pollinate. Another thing you could do is you could dodge the pollen window of the first crop by about two weeks or so. So let's say you have your silks and your tassels on the corn, which you'll learn about in just a second, I promise. When that's happening on one corn, as long as you planted the other corn a couple weeks behind that point, when its silks and tassels have formed, they're not gonna cross pollinate because there's no actual reproductive organs to be able to do it on the other corn. So that's one thing that you can do. And then the final thing that you can do is just stagger plant in a way that plays with the days to maturity. Kind of like if you were growing tomatoes or potatoes. You'd have an early season potato, a mid and a late. You could plant them all at the same time. They just mature at different rates. Corn, same thing. Pick a couple varieties that mature in 70 days, a couple that mature in 90 days. You're missing that by 20 days, you're good to go. Finally, it is time to actually sow our corn seeds. A lot of us know what corn seeds look like, unlike many plants in the garden, because it's actually the part of the plant that we're primarily eating. So take a look at these ones right here. I believe these are called American Dream. This is a sweet corn. It's an All America Selections winner, which means that some fancy people decided that it was one of the best corn in the world for one of these years. I believe this was 2019. So you can 100% I actually recommend starting corn in the ground that you're going to plant it in. But just for an example, I will show you that you can transplant corn. So. This is my Epic six cell seed starting tray, my favorite tray of all time, that's why I sell it on the store, but you could use anything. You could use a Tupperware, you could use a plastic bag, it doesn't really matter as long as it holds some soil. So take a scoop of some seed starting mix, and with corn, because it is a hard husk sort of, you know, rough seed, a lot of people will wanna soak it. You don't really have to do that, honestly. As long as you bury it about a half an inch deep, in one of these trays or in the ground, you're in a very good spot. So what I do typically is I just stick my finger, I poke it slightly, or at least I'll half fill the tray. So sometimes I'll take the tray like this, I'll fill it halfway, and then just drop the seeds in like this. 
and I only plant one, maybe two per hole. Two will guarantee germination. So if you see two, then you just snip the one that looks a little bit less vigorous. But corn is a really easy starter, guys. Half inch, maybe an inch down, not too much more than that. And we'll have to now talk about what to do when these actually grow up and it's time to transplant them. We're back out here in the plot with the corn that you saw at the beginning of the video. What we're talking about now is the spacing and the planting strategy for corn. It is a wind pollinated plant. The way that the corn works is you're gonna have the corn stalk go up. It's gonna produce these things called tassels. It's the male part of the plant. That contains the pollen. And then below you have the little ears and the silks. The silks need to catch the grains of pollen from the tassels and that's really only happening with some environmental stress, right? So most of the time it's gonna be wind. The reason why you plant it in blocks is so that that pollen gets a better chance of hitting the silks. Because the way it actually works botanically is a grain of pollen has to go into an individual thread of the silk, has to travel all the way down into the ear, and that's one kernel of corn. So that's why a corn may not be perfectly aesthetic. It might not have all the grains in there because it was improperly pollinated. So you have to plant it in a block like this. You'll see we kind of have two blocks here. It's just we don't have enough corn right here, so we're going to put another crop down the middle. But nevertheless, this is a pretty good spacing here, about 10 inches apart on center. I got 15 here, 16 here. It's looking really good. All we need to do now is get them in the ground. So I'm here with my garden manager, Jacques. Hey. He's gonna tackle this side. I'm gonna tackle this side. We've got some amendments here for planting. And we really just wanna talk about some of the soil prep. So we, we grew some potatoes here. Many of you have probably seen that video. If you haven't, go check it out. But potatoes really didn't amend the soil too much. It's a pioneer crop. You don't really need to. Our soil actually here in our area of San Diego is pretty good. Um, so I did amend the soil after the potatoes. What we did is we added a lot of municipal compost, mixed it in, actually did till a little bit just to get it in there because the potatoes were dug in trenches. So we had to break that hard clay up a little bit. But besides that, not too much. I guess we worked in some of the straw. Yeah, that's one interesting thing we did is we put a lot of the straw in. Put a lot of the straw in that was used to mulch the potatoes. But after this with corn, I mean, the transplanting process is really easy. I'll give you the blood meal, Jacques, and uh, I'll take the cottonseed meal. It's, it's a grass. It's a heavy nitrogen crop, especially at the start of its life. Blood meal is a 12 0, 0. Cottonseed meal, if you prefer a vegan option, is a 621. These are both from Espoma Organic, who's the sponsor of the video. But it's up to you which one you use or if you use one at all. I personally am going to, even though I did amend this soil, because I just want to make sure that these have enough to really start going once we put them in the ground. And an organic fertilizer is not, you can't really overdo it. It's hard to overdo an organic one, which is why I like to go that route. So in we go. Actually, I just forgot to put it in, so let's put some of this in. But I'll do, I'll do one example over here. So just a little sprinkling. I don't get very precise or very precious about the exact amount that I add in. But I do add it in, and then you just go ahead and form it up around it. And your corn is in the ground. I'm putting in some cottonseed meal. He's got blood, blood meal over there. Actually, it might be an interesting test. Yeah. Because they're both relatively high nitrogen. This is a 621. Blood meal is a uh, 1200. They're both from a small organic. We'll, we'll see which one does better, but regardless, the whole point was to put in something with a good amount of nitrogen for the young corn, which is gonna need it. Yeah, it's really important at the beginning to make sure corn has enough fertilizer. Yeah. It's a grass, remember, it's a grass. So what does a grass grow a lot of leaves? What do leaves use a lot of nitrogen? So it's pretty simple when you think about it that way, uh, but you do have to remember to do it. All right, the corn is in, both sides. I wanna give it a really nice and healthy water. You really wanna make sure that you saturate the soil. For us, mixing in this compost and mixing in some amendments sometimes makes it a little hard to rehydrate the soil, so I have to spend a little extra time just making sure I get it soaked in. The other thing you might be wondering is why isn't there mulch on this corn yet? Well, I have a big problem that I've never had before in my old garden with earwigs or pincher bugs. They're everywhere in the backyard here and they love to hang out in this straw and they particularly like to eat corn. It's one of their favorite plants to eat. And so what I'm gonna do is let this establish, get a little bit older, a little bit stronger and more resilient before I mulch it and invite those earwigs in. And I might even lay down some organic controls which we'll talk about like one of these oil traps that I've done a video on before. That's what I'm gonna do. You're probably gonna to wanna to mulch the corn. It's somewhat shallow rooted. It's not gonna to wanna to dry out. So the mulch is important, but I'm just waiting because I know I have a particular pest. But we'll see you back once we have something to say. 
back over here growing our corn. It's been about two to three weeks or so, and the corn really has started to take off. You can see nice dark green growth, not a whole lot of issues to speak of. A couple changes that we've made here. Number one, most obviously, is the straw mulch that I've laid over the top. I took a bit of a breather on the straw mulch because we have an earwig problem across the whole homestead. It seems like San Diego in general has an earwig problem. Since straw is like the perfect environment for those earwigs to thrive. So when the corn was young, I kept the mulch off and just made sure I watered the bed. Now I think it can stave off at least some of that damage. Haven't seen any, fingers crossed, yet. So I put about two inches of straw mulch on this. This is the garden straw, the shredded straw mulch that I offer for sale on the store. Best straw mulch I've personally ever used in my life. Extremely high quality. But just any sort of mulch on top is gonna be great because corn wants to remain adequately moist throughout the growing season, especially in this phase when it's putting on a lot of new growth. So the only other real thing that we've done in this patch since the last time we talked was just a water here and there, usually a nice deep soak, and then sometimes a fertigation. So watering with fertilized water, just using an organic liquid fertilizer that just drinks it right up. In this early stage, higher on nitrogen, but man, the corn looks really great. Not too much to say until the next phase of growth. I lied, one thing I'm gonna do really quickly is just interplant some squash. We have this little row down here, nice little pathway, but would rather make it into something a little bit more productive and, and actually protective. So what's nice about the squash is it's going to spread out across the entirety of this bed, almost as an edible ground cover. So that's exactly what I wanna do. I'm gonna put it in right here, I'll put one in up there, and they'll sort of snake its way through and provide an extra layer of living mulch in this bed. We're back here in the corn patch. It is June 22nd, 2021. I was gone for about four or five days doing a garden install and a couple workshops. And by the time I came back, no joke, at least a couple of these tassels are taller than me, which is fantastic. When I left, it was probably about here or so. So the growth, needless to say, has been Pretty insane, but what I wanna do now, we're not ready to harvest, but we do have silk development, early ear development, and a couple weird mutations or things to watch out for that I wanna show you. Up first, you can see these silks have been coming out. We can see a corn ear right here. If I give it a little squeeze, I know for a fact it's not fully developed yet. And another way you know is because these silks really haven't started to brown and really dry and die up. They're probably close to past the point of being able to accept pollen, especially these ones down here but these ones still look quite young, and I think we're still getting some pollination on this cob here. Another weird thing to note is that one corn plant can create multiple offshoots, and so as you can see, we do have some silk formation right there, right there, but on this offshoot right here, for example, we have another one, and so you can get secondary tasseling on these side shoots. Something that's very odd that can happen on the side shoots is this right here. So I pulled it off earlier, but you can even see a weird little mutation up top. I had some silks forming at the top of this right here, which is the top of the tassel. Sort of a weird thing. Apparently it happens on the side shoots. I wouldn't stress out about it too much. It seems to happen to a lot of different people. What's interesting about this particular variety of corn is that this is the same variety, but you can see this is a almost perfectly white tassel. This one is sort of a darker reddish color. Your general rule of thumb on harvesting your corn, besides the silk tip that I just gave you, is three weeks from tassel formation. But it depends, right? Like everything in gardening. I started these earlier than the typical time you would start corn, so that's gonna slow them down slightly. Your variety, the way you've cared for it. So for me, based on what I saw on the ears and the silks, I'm probably looking at another two weeks, and it's been about two since I've seen the tassels, so I'll check in with you in a couple weeks and we'll get a fresh ear of corn. I almost forgot to take you out here in the front yard to check out the dwarf corn and its progress. The smallest little corn I've ever seen. These tassels are maybe two feet from the soil surface. I don't know if it's supposed to be that level of dwarf, but nevertheless, still getting corn formation. Some ears down here, they at least feel full. Hopefully they actually are full. I, I'm not quite sure. I have a sneaking suspicion that maybe the pollination wasn't quite up to par on these ones, but nevertheless, we're still gonna wait for the ears to fill up. Out here in the front yard, this tiny little dwarf corn. I'm not super optimistic about it, but I figured I would show you what it looks like, so let's do a little harvest here too. This one looks pretty good. Silks came right off, tiny. Let's see what we get out of this little guy. Oh! 
That's actually not bad. A little corn worm in there, but that's fine. Okay, the pollination's a little off. Actually, no, it's an earwig. I swear I had a huge problem with earwigs this year, guys. I have a couple solutions. I'll maybe do a video about it, but that's kind of frustrating. Take a look, a little earwig in there. But the color of the kernels are actually very, very interesting and impressive. So maybe a couple other of these will be good. I actually did get a slightly better one. There was still a corn worm at the top there, but other than that, that actually looks pretty solid. Well, the moment is finally here. I'm super excited because almost all of this corn is ready to harvest and eat, and I'm gonna eat it I'll call it 90s style, it's how I grew up eating it. But let's take a look close up so you know how and when to harvest your corn. There are a few different ways to do this, but I like to look at the silks. Remember, this is the female part of the plant. When they're starting to brown like this, it's a good indicator. And what I like to do is then kind of squeeze the cob and see if I feel full formation. Another thing people will do is they'll give the silks a little tug, almost like they're pulling someone's hair. And if they come off easy, that's how you know it's time. A final method that some people will do, and I'll show it to you right now, is to get a little curious and actually just peel away at the exterior and take a look at that kernel formation. And then what you'll do is you just poke one of the kernels, and if it's easy to poke and a little white fluid comes out, kind of like that right there, you're good to harvest. So it's been a long time coming. The light is shining through the corn field, the corn patch here. So let's take this guy and you just wanna pull it right off the stalk. So you can take it and just crack it right off, give it a little twist at the bottom, and here we go. Now I could just eat this as is, put it in the microwave or steam it, but I do wanna show you the actual corn. Let's take a look at it. Let's see what we got going on. I'm already seeing some, oh yes. That's what I'm talking about. This is why you grow your own, guys. Look at this, you're not getting this at the supermarket. And this is a sweet corn. I can eat this, just as is. Hold on, let's get this out. Oh, what? Whoa, okay. We got triplets? Looks like this one tried to develop some secondary ears right here. That's really weird. Comment down below, I haven't seen this before yet with corn. I'm sure I'm just a novice, but take a look at that. Well, this is a surprise. It's like I have a little corn sword. I was running around harvesting some tomatoes with it, like slicing it off the vine, but <laughs> I think I need to actually eat this thing. I looked it up. It seems like what's going on is called MESS, multiple ears, same shank. Kind of a funky little acronym there, but nevertheless, still a perfectly fine piece of corn right here. You can see on the top, there's a little bit of a improper pollination or probably dried out a little bit, but the rest of this is absolutely gorgeous. So. One thing I think you guys should probably know is that if you're growing sweet corn and you harvest it out of the field right there, you can just eat it like that. You don't have to cook it, although I will be, but that's delicious, nice and sweet. I think maybe if you have some problems with your stomach, it might not be the best idea, but I've eaten like six of these already and they're really tasty. I don't even bring them inside, but I will bring it inside right now because I got to do the 90s preparation, the 1990s cooking preparation for an ear of corn. Okay, I lied. I'm keeping it out here because it's so nice out. We're going 90s mode, and this is what my mom did at least, and I, I think a lot of people probably did this when they were a kid. Just wet a paper towel, roll it up, twist the ends off, little miniature steamer here. I'm going to toss it in the microwave for like five minutes or so. I know it's not the fanciest way to cook corn. I know that, but I'm doing a little throwback, guys. You got to cut me some slack. I'm going to try these little baby corn too. We'll see if they end up tasting like baby corn or if they just taste kind of weird and gross. But either way, these are going in for about this, well, probably less time, maybe two minutes or so on these ones. But here we go. Let's toss it in. And there we have it. The two little pathetic corn are right there. But let's unwrap this and see if the color changed at all before we get down to eating it. Oh, yes, it did. Look at that. Almost looks like glass gem style corn now. Okay, we're giving it that classic 90s prep. You butter the whole thing up. In a perfect world, I would be like twirling it perfectly with those little corn cob things. But we'll do it, do a little natural this way. We're gonna butter up the baby corns. <laughs> This is just how you did it back then. I don't know, this is how I grew up. 
Maybe it's why I like bad food today because I can't imagine this is extremely healthy way to consume corn. I'm hitting it with a little bit of that garlic salt. This is a homegrown garlic salt from a friend of mine. So we're gonna go garlic salt and we're gonna hit it with some smoked paprika straight out of Spain. So this is when I was in Barcelona. So I've thoroughly seasoned this. Let's taste it. Well, here we have it. We should probably try the baby corn first and see what happens. So I'm gonna hit it with a little more of that garlic salt. See how these taste. Mm. No, that's not happening. <laughs> that's not happening. What's going on there is basically it's a completely unformed baby corn in the sense that it didn't even get fertilized. The silks didn't even carry pollen down. So the actual kernels are just sort of limp. And then there's a very tough interior core, not great eating. But what is probably great eating is this guy right here. So let's give this a taste. Oh, that's hot. That's actually really hot. You know what? We might need a little, little, little salt bay on this. Oh yeah. Okay, here we go. Let's try this. That's what I'm talking about. It's just so good. It's just so good this way. Mmm. Okay. A plus. There's probably a million ways to cook corn that tastes even better, but this is the one I grew up with. Guys, if you have any questions growing corn, this was a full seed to harvest guide, but there are some things that we didn't cover like pests and diseases to deal with. Maybe I'll do a different video on that in the future, but I just wanna encourage you to grow stuff from seed so you can have these types of moments, chilling out here in the backyard, eating my beautiful looking piece of corn. Good luck in the garden and keep on growing. Mm.